Angela and Mr. Ray. Angela is applying to join the library. Listen to the conversation and complete the form below. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will never hear the recording a second time. Hello. How can I join the library? Well, you need to make an application. Would you like to do it now? Yes, if I can. One moment and I'll get the form. Now, I just need to ask you a few questions before you sign at the bottom. Okay. Your full name, please. Angela Mary Price. Price? Yes, that's right. Okay, and your address? Apartment 3, 86 Bridge Street, Pimlico. Bridge Street? That's just near here, isn't it? Yes, not very far. Good. So the postcode must be 2065, right? Yes, that's right. Now, your telephone number. I need both home and work if you have them. My home number is 8763-5142, and work is 8456-1307. Do you need anything else, like ID or something? Yes, your driver's license will do, if you have one. Right. It's easy to remember. I know it by heart. 4040AC. I'm afraid I'll also need to see it. Okay. Here it is. Thanks. And your date of birth, please? 24 March 1981. Okay. Thanks. That's the most important part completed. But if you don't mind, I'd also like to ask you a few questions for a survey we're conducting. Yes, that's okay. Now you have some time to read questions 6 to 10. As the conversation continues, answer questions 6 to 10. What kind of books do you like to read? Here's a list to look at. Oh, it varies from time to time, but I always like to relax and learn about other countries I might visit one day. I don't like anything too heavy or serious, unless it's about animals or the environment. I'm not really into sport very much. Anything else? Well, I do like entertaining at home. You know, dinner parties. So I suppose you'll have something for me in that line. The pictures in those books always make me hungry, although they never seem to turn out exactly as they look in the books. Fine. I think that's all I need now, except I need you to sign here on the application form. Oh, and I almost forgot. The membership fee is $20, which is refundable if you no longer stay a member. There you are. Do I sign at the bottom here? Yes, that's right. You can borrow books now if you wish, although your membership card won't be ready until next week. So if you want to borrow today, you can pick up your card when you return your first books. That's if you want to take some now. I think I will, but I'll have a look around first. Okay. Take your time. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16.
Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Hi, Joanna. What's the matter? You look a bit depressed. Hi, Kamal. I've just been reading this article in the newspaper about how difficult it is for sociology students to get a job after they graduate. They always want people with work experience. How do you get work experience if they won't give you a job? It's an impossible situation. Yes, I know. It's a real problem. And the article says that some people spend a year or more living at home doing unpaid voluntary work just to get something to put on their CVs. Really boring stuff like photocopying and addressing envelopes. I don't want to do anything like that. I want a real job. It's the elections for the Students' Union Committee posts next month here at the university. All the positions are up for election. Academic officer, sports What's officer... What's your point? And the position of equal opportunities officer is coming up for election. I'm still not sure what you're getting at. Why don't you stand for it? The post starts in June. You're well known at the university, and I think you would be good at it. Equal opportunities officer? That sounds great. Isn't that the students' union officer who promotes equality within the university? Yes, that's right. They raise awareness of equal opportunities for everyone in the university and promote the issue around campus. I'd love to do something for women on campus, but what about my studies? It's a paid sabbatical post. Sabbatical? Yes. That means you take a year off and then start your studies again. Meanwhile, you get really good work experience and you can earn money at the same time. That sounds really interesting. But how do I get elected? You go to the Students' Union, fill in an application form and just give it to the Union. Then, I guess, you need to put together a manifesto and try to get people to support you. I'll help you with your campaign and I'll help you with publicity materials like posters for the notice boards and leaflets to hand out to everyone. It sounds really exciting. What exactly does the Equal Opportunities Officer do? I'm not really sure. Let's have a look at the Students' Union website. There it is. Hmm. The Equal Opportunities Officer is responsible for anything which concerns women and equal rights and is responsible to the Students' Union Executive Committee for making sure that any racism or sexism is dealt with. Students' union officers have to be available for students to talk about any problems they have and try to help them. I would love that part of the job, giving help and advice to students. The whole reason I want to work in social services is to help people. That would be very good experience. It's a big responsibility too. It also says that you're in charge of a budget and you would be responsible for managing a team of people. It's good experience for a management position in the future. Now I'm getting really excited. What about the day-to-day -day responsibilities? It says here that the Equal Opportunities Officer acts on any health and safety issues. The Equal Opportunities Officer represents all the students on university committees like the Safety Committee and the Equal Opportunities Committee. Lots of meetings, then. I don't think I would enjoy all those meetings quite so much. My first aid certificate might be useful for safety issues. Very useful. And you would supervise the running of the crash, make sure that students with young children have access to childcare, that sort of thing. Oh, look, the Equal Opportunities Officer also has responsibility for the university bus service. Perhaps I could even get it to run on time. No, don't be too ambitious. We have to get you elected first. Let's take a walk to the union office. Maybe we can meet the Equal Opportunities Officer and talk to her about the job. Great, let's go. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. That's about all I want to say about the course and coursework. As you heard, it's very intensive and there's a lot of work to do. So, how to deal with all the work? It's really important to make sure you have good study skills. 
It makes the difference between failing, just passing, or doing well on any course. There are workshops given by student service counsellors on study skills, but I just want to put you in the picture with a quick overview of useful study skills. There are five points I want to make here. The main thing is to get organised. The first thing you need to do, as soon as you get your timetable and reading list, is to draw up a plan of study. Time management is what all students are bad at. Unfortunately, it's what they need to be very good at. Make up a timetable and put in all the things like lab work, lectures, seminars, and tutorials that you will attend. Make a note of exactly what work you will do for each of your courses. Where do we get that from? Your lecturer will tell you exactly how you will be assessed at the end of the course. Make sure that you add in time for reading, preparing seminars, and so on. Put deadlines into your study plan and put these deadlines into your computer to remind you when they are. With deadlines, you need to be realistic and know yourself. Are you the kind of person who leaves things to the last minute? If you are, make sure you remind yourself about deadlines well in advance. Don't leave things to the last minute. That sounds like me. Aim to have a balanced life of academic work, a paid job if you need one, and social activities. As a rough guide, you should be doing forty hours of academic work per week, and five to fifteen hours for a part-time job, no more. The second point is don't be late or miss lectures. Remember, the person giving the lecture is probably the same person who sets your exams. In lectures, you hear information from the person who will be testing you on it. You will take much longer to gather it from other sources. Classes offer an opportunity to ask questions about difficult material, and you won't miss extra information. Thirdly, make sure that you regularly re-read your notes from lectures, books, and handouts. This will help you remember what you have done. Finally, two more important points: we expect you to work long hours on your own. The information we give you in tutorials and lectures is just a starting point, often comprising the main points of themes of the subject. After this, it's up to you to go into detail about the topic and be familiar enough on certain points to give a seminar on it if asked. The next and last point is this: you need to think about what you read and any information you get on a topic. We are looking for students who can evaluate material critically. Students who can think critically, students who simply read and remember information, do not make as good progress as students who think about the subject and form their own opinions on it, based on looking at the subject from all points of view. So we are not just learning facts and figures. Facts and figures are an important part of learning, but not the most important thing. It's what you do with them that is critical. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You'll hear two university students discussing a social science lecture they attended. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Did you go to the first social science lecture yesterday? Yeah, didn't you see me there? No, I was trying so hard to understand the lecturer. What didn't you understand? A lot of it, really. For example, he said we needed to study history as part of the course, but I didn't get why. You probably missed it. 
He said early on that we need to learn from our past mistakes. Right, but he also said we need to put ourselves in the place of our ancestors. Why is that? I think the point is that it's not enough to know how they lived and what they did. We need to know what they thought. I see, and I've written transferable skills in my notes next, but I have no idea what that means. If you study social science, you learn skills that you can use in a job. Oh right, is that all? Okay, but why is that? The point he made was that in studying social science, you use a flexible and adaptable approach to learning. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-five to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-five to thirty. He also kept mentioning all the other subjects we will need to study as part of the course. I didn't write them all down. Did you? Some of them. I think I can make sense of my notes. The first one was anthropology, which he said would cover prehistory and archaeology as well. Okay. Then there's economics. I wrote down that this was not meant to mean that we will spend all our time looking at economic theory, but more that we need to see how humans behave. That's good. I don't think I could handle economic theory. He said something about education too, didn't he? Yeah, he said we'll be looking at how cultural information is handed down from one generation to the next through teaching children. He said we'd be focusing on geography too, but I can't really remember which aspects. Can you? I noted it down. I think. Here we are. Yes, particularly in relation to urban planning. It's law that I got confused about. I didn't understand why he linked that to economics. I think he meant that laws affect the way wealth is distributed. That makes sense. Now, what are the science wars? Okay, I did get that. The science wars are about how social science collects information. In sociology and social work, and in social science generally, they can only study patterns of behavior and observe. If you compare that to the way scientists work in physics or chemistry, it's very different. Because they use specific experiments that can be tested and which give concrete answers, social studies is often accused of being unscientific. That's all. Okay, but it still looks like a good course, doesn't it? You don't have any regrets, do you? None at all. I'm looking forward to it. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. Listen to the following talk between two friends and answer the questions with no more than three words. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Do you know what, Tom? It won't be long before we'll all be travelling to space in a cable car. A cable car? What do you mean? A sort of sky lift? Well, yes, I suppose so. You must be joking. Where on earth did you get that idea from? Oh, I've just been reading it in a book called Apes to Astronauts by Adrian Berry. He's the science correspondent of the Daily Telegraph, so he should know what he's talking about. He says, wait a minute, I've got it here, page 28. A cable car to the heavens. Oh, honestly, Jane, you surely don't believe all that stuff you read in those sci-fi books. It's not science fiction. It's a fact. Hang on. I'll read you what he says. The space writer Arthur C. Clarke, to whose inspiration we owe the communications satellite, recently outlined a proposal for a new means of space travel, which, he admitted, is so outrageous that many of you may consider it not even science fiction, but pure fantasy. Shall I go on? No, just tell me how he thinks it could be done. Well, it sounds quite simple, really. One end of a cable, 23,000 miles long. How long? 23,000 miles. Do listen. One end of a cable, 23,000 miles long, would be attached to a point on the Earth's equator and the other to a satellite in geostationary orbit. So? The cable would be absolutely tight between the two points and the elevator would travel up and down, carrying people and freight. According to Arthur Clarke, it's the only way to travel in space without using rocket engines, which would make it much more economical. I wonder if it would be more comfortable. It sounds pretty uncomfortable to me, and heaven knows what speed it would be travelling at. Uh, what would happen if the cable broke? Oh, he explains all that. Apparently, the most likely place for it to break would be at or near the ground. And if that happened, it wouldn't fall down. It would fall upwards. Upwards? Hmm. Yes, I suppose it would. Yes. Sounds funny, doesn't it? Something falling upwards. Anyway... It wouldn't matter too much either if the cable broke away from the high end. It would remain rigid until it could be reattached to the satellite. I don't quite see why. Well, it would be the pull of gravity from above. Anyway, who'd want to be stuck in an elevator attached to a rigid cable thousands of miles up in space? I suppose he doesn't say what would happen if it broke in the middle. Actually, he does. He says it would be dangerous if the break occurred at any altitude up to 15,000 miles because the bit attached to the Earth would, what does he say, oh yes, collapse and wrap itself around the equator like a whiplash. Whiplash? You know, the long bit of cord or leather on a whip. Anyway, even that would only be really catastrophic if the cable was made of steel or some other metal. Metals are much too heavy. The cable would have to be made of some material capable of suspension without snapping. But I thought you said the cable would be 23,000 miles long. I did, but the 3,000 mile breaking length is because of gravity. Well, all I can say is you'll never catch me going to space in a cable car. I'd rather keep my feet on the ground, thank you very much. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.